Great. Um, I'd say we start uh, because I have a lot of a lot of content to cover, and I'd love to leave room for some questions at the end. So, with that. Let's get started. So, welcome, welcome to the discussion about the patterns that your microservice teams should all be familiar uh, with. My name is Victor Renta. Uh, I am a Java champion, coding for 18 years. Or in the past 10 years, I spent doing workshops and consultancy in various companies throughout Europe. So this is what I do for a living. Every day, I get to meet people from different companies and debate whatever concerns them, uh, discuss a lot of stuff. My main focus is clean code testing architecture, Java frameworks, performance and secure coding. And this is what I do every day. Some people say it's a bit insane because I get to talk with the best people basically in each company that I go to, right? They will all send me their tech leads, their seniors, their architects so that they can teach in turn the others in the company. So uh, the stuff that I uh, brainstorm that I learn myself from the discussions I compile in talks like this or, uh, that I give for conferences or for my community. I have a community which is the largest community in the world focusing on software crafting. It's, it went over 6,500 developers for all over, from all over the world. To give you an example, one week ago, I uh, talked Thursday, uh, I, Wednesday, uh, we discussed uh, Java concurrency trends and use cases. I presented for one hour over Zoom, full online. I presented for one, one hour, and then there were 40 minutes of questions from the audience. 40 minutes just answering ideas and questions, and it's all recorded on my YouTube channel. So if you want to join, feel free. It's super fun. There are people from all over the world, usually over 100, 150 live attendees. And we meet every month. Two kids, a cat, and a garden. So let's get going. Um, the benefits of microservices, as, uh, as in the commercial, right? The first thing that your business is going to love with microservices, they are going to get faster to the market, right? They can put their ideas to test faster. The developers will love microservices also because they put harder boundaries between the, p the pieces that they have to maintain. They lower their, they, they lower their cognitive load, right? Then, then, some of my clients went to microservices because they wanted to upgrade the frameworks and the language versions. You can't do that with a large monolith. It's much easier and much less risk if you go with microservices. But for what we are concerned today, uh, microservices bring some unique advantages in terms of scalability and availability. You can scale only the part that, you, that are really taking a lot of heat, and also you can build systems that are tolerant to partial failures. If your monolith is dead, rest in peace. Your whole, all your endpoints are dead, right? In a microservice, you have more flexibility in this regard. All right, now, but we're safe because we use rest between the microservices that we build. So what can go wrong? After all, we all know that the network is reliable, it has zero latency, it has infinite bandwidth and zero cost. I mean, like, right? What, what, could, what can be the problem? And then you wake up. Welcome to the fallacies of distributed computing. Some of you already experienced issues like this. So, what happens? It happens that you are starting to build a distributed system. And I love this definition. A distributed system is one in which the failure of a computer you didn't even know existed can render your own machine unusable. Beautiful definition from Leslie Lamport. So, you have this wonderful business idea. And suppose you get to... Uh, uh, you get some wonderful developers to translate it into code, and you have your product, you put your product to production, and then boom. What, what would, what's going to happen? No matter what bri how brilliant idea you're going to have, if you cannot withstand production, if you have 90% availability, you're dead. People are going to run from you, are going to run away, your customers are going dis to be disappointed. So that's a mandatory thing today, to have availability. Availability is the proportion of time that you are, you are uh, serving requests divided by the total time. In more formal terms, is the time it takes you to get into some serious issue, the mean time to failure, divided by that plus the time it takes you to recover. Now, wh how can we improve this? Well, we can make sure we fail less frequently by doing more testing. I don't have to tell you that we need to write unit tests, integration tests, end-to-end -end smoke, but what many teams don't uh, see as an immediate requirement is to build low tests, spike tests, resilient tests. Who, is, who of you has ever heard of Toxiproxy before? That's a beautiful piece from, Spotify, from Shopify. 
who can introduce network failures randomly, can, can delay traffic between you and your Postgres in your Docker running next, next by. So it's, it's a very good tool to experiment with your performance and resilience. Right? Very few teams in Python, like there were four hands in the room. Are, this is largely unknown, but you are, if you are taking serious heat, go next step, try to see, try to introduce poison into your network to see what happens. Right? Then, of course, when you have a failure, you need to recover as fast as you can. And we want to have detection mechanisms, ways that we, we can be back up as soon as possible, as fast as possible. We're going to cover today a series of resilience patterns. But we need to start by defining what a, res what a resilient system is. A resilient system is able to uh, handle unexpected situations with none or very little disturbance of the user, with, with a graceful degradation of your service, or ideally with, without the user even noticing the failure. Now, how can you do that? And what, what, and what is graceful degradation? And I, I, I came up with some, with some examples for you guys. First of all, if you are trying to retrieve some data from a system and that system is down, you could serve an older value and hope that nothing would go wrong. Or you could return a lower, or lower quality. Imagine Netflix. If the recommendation service is down, you could see the recommendations per country, not the ones tailored for your own user profile. Right? Lower quality, but still good enough. Or you could end up calling the, a slower system to retrieve the same data if the fast one is down. Imagine you have your Elasticsearch down, you could query the SQL database instead. Slower, but you're going to get the job done. And you can actually uh, you can actually uh, tell the user, hey, you know what? We are going to send you the results via email when they're done. So if these failures happen frequently, you could, take, you could do tricks to save the experience, right? But these things are trying to read data. What if the user wanted to change something? What, did they, what, what if we are talking about a command trying to change some state? Well, the one thing you could do, if you can't reach the other system, you could store that command into a table and then schedule some retries until you get the message through. Now, when you're sick trying to reinvent the wheel, you could switch to using a messaging, messaging infrastructure like Kafka, like Rabbit, and send the message to the queue, and that message is going to end up on the other side safely. Right? Or at least you can do, the, the very least you, can, you could do is to log the error and then have some alarms calling the cavalry, the human intervention to fix the problem. Now, if you have too frequent failures like this, probably you want to implement some automatic recovery. Maybe a supervisor that can do some automatic tricks. Some people call this the saga pattern, right? To fix the issues without needing human intervention. Okay? So graceful degradation. Try to, to, to preserve the user experience, try to do your best not to show the failure. Now, we're going to study these patterns grouped in four categories. Isolation, latency control, loose coupling, and supervision. Now, let's start with the isolation. And let's imagine a scenario of a catastrophic failure in which every single endpoint in your system is down. Now, uh, what should you do to avoid such, such scenarios? You need to break your system into smaller pieces and then go ahead and isolate those pieces against each other. But how? And, and uh, uh, let's continue with, to see examples from the wild, from the industry that I've seen in different companies of catastrophic failures. Some developers over there were very happy to use REST. So happy that they use REST to call other services, which use REST to call other services, and so on for five hops. A long chain of REST calls. Anything can go wrong on this chain. Any failure anywhere can blow up the whole thing. Any, 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 any delay in this processing can delay all the, the upstream systems. It's a terrible, fragile architecture. Some people have named this a distributed monolith architecture. The worst of all worlds, right? But the idea is this is a default place to go as a developer. Or you could have a request causing an instance to restart. And then the client could retry that request ad infinitum, causing your, 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 an instance to, to, to go down every time. You could then move to messaging, saying, hey, you know, messages are safer, are more resilient, let's do messages. But then you receive one particular message that causes your listener to crash. And then the message is going to be retried 
and then fail again, and then retry it again, and then basically froze, f freeze the entire stream of messages. This is called the poison pill message, right? So you're not 100% safe if you go messages. Or you could have queues. Another client of mine got a failure in production because they ran out of disk space on the Kafka broker. So they stored so many messages, they, they went to bananas, right? And then they realized they weren't monitoring the size of their topics. They didn't have any alarms to sound when, the, when there were more than 10 billion messages on the, on the queue, right? So, oops, right? And then, and then, of course, the, the sender, or the, the one that tried to push messages into Kafka blew in, in its turn, and so on, because the, the failure cascaded upstream. Or you, you could keep the queues in memory and then run out of memory. Beautiful failure. Or you could have, oh, this is, a this is, a, this is the best one. At the, first level, at the first floor, the secretary was running the end of month, uh, it was, she was generating the end of month uh, reports. But then because they, they took too long to complete and the screen froze, she pressed F5. One more time, baby, and then again and again. Five concurrent exports. One floor above, a, patient, a doctor was trying to consult a patient to try to access the health record of that patient. Guess what? The f application froze because the database was burning due to the five concurrent exports that, was torch that were torching the, the DB file system. So <laughs> this is some stupid case that can happen just because you did not foresee uh, intense flows that weren't throttled, that weren't limited in any way. So we want to, you, you see, you want to introduce boundaries in, um, around, your, around parts of your system. And humans have done that for ages in naval industry. Every ship that floats, they build, last minute changes, they build walls. And then if one of these walls fails, okay, this drawing is not the perfect one, but you get the point. This, let me fix, uh, live production fix, works? Says a hash in production. There you go. So we have this excellent. We have this uh, this buoy, these walls built within the ship, and if one of these areas gets flooded, then the ship will still stay afloat. Okay, you will experience some issues. The ship is going to tilt a bit, but it still does not sink. The same we want to do with our system within our architecture. We need to identify the pieces that should still work, even if other parts of our system are down. So you're going to draw these lines and say whatever is green should not depend on stuff that is yellow or blue. Now, the next thing you do, if the blue ones have to work even without the green ones, you would have to cache, to replicate some data from the green ones in order to withstand, in order to survive them being down, of course. So you are going to use these boundaries as boundaries of redundancy. And then, if one of these bubbles will take a lot of heat is enough to just scale up that bubble, not the whole, not every single service. So identifying what should still work if other pieces are down, it's a very important design decision you need to take in your microservice architecture. Right? Okay, and here, is, here are some examples. Perhaps the catalog could be down, but the user can still search or and place orders. Or perhaps the search is not functioning, but they could still check out their, their cart, right? Or you deploy the same product in three countries. If you lose Rouma Romania, you could still save France and Switzerland, perhaps, right? So separate areas, or if you develop a cloud solution to have your clients not influencing each other, to have, uh, if, if imagine you have a very important tenant, a very, imp a very, very a key customer. You don't want them to fail if others of your cloud's clients are blowing up. So you need to put a bit of isolation in between. How can you isolate these bullheads? The first thing you could do is to use different connection and thread pools, different resources within the same application. Next level, deploy different in application instances, completely different. One process could fail, the other could still work. The next level will be to fully separate down to the database and messaging infrastructure to have completely separated resources involved in each of the bulkheads. Depending on how much you want to invest in this and how and where do you happen to see the failures, you can go deeper or not. Okay? But then imagine that you have these bulkheads. And one of the services in one of the area fires a whole lot of load on a service from another bulkhead. Or maybe a client from the internet 
uh, floods you with requests. And I'm not talking about a denial of service. I'm talking about a, a, a normal case, but then too many requests. What would you do in this case? Then another resilience pattern in this regard is called throttling. Throttling means you need to put an artificial limit to the amount of load the server could take. I would prefer to see some 503 service unavailable than to crash my server with out of memory. I would prefer to drop some of the requests in order to preserve my response times. What good is a success response in 60 seconds? I would probably prefer to have an error in 30 minutes than an, a success in one minute. Of course, it's highly context dependent, but that's something they should, you should consider, right? Or maybe the export invoices that the secretary was running is not allowed to impact the place order endpoint. You want to give more priority to the place order because it's business critical, right? Or, if you have multiple clients, you don't want one client to be rude and then basically take over uh, much more resources than others, okay? And you will return a 429 too many request status, telling that client to back off and to, 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 to lower their, their, their rate of call, right? Or you could just try to fit the budget to avoid auto scaling because you don't have a large budget, you do your best and you drop some of the requests. Now, what can you throttle? There are basically three main things you can throttle. The number of requests per second, the number of concurrent requests that happen at the same time, and the stuff that directly costs you, like traffic or maybe even resource unit if you are in a cloud environment. So throttle these, either globally or per client or per endpoint. Right? And here is an example. Here is an example of a critical flow over here, which is left untouched when you have some performance issues over here. There is the blue feature, which is, which is downgraded, which, is, which takes less precedence, and there is the orange one, which is just stopped, completely stopped. Nothing, all the requests are rejected. Why? Because you want to give preference to this guy, to the business critical one, you see? But what do you do if your usage looks like this? What if you face a lot of usage spikes, bulks of requests coming in in pages to you, like 1,000 requests per a single second. What do you do? How do you survive? Now, something that all engineers have to understand is the performance response curve. On the, on the vertical axis, we have the number of requests you can successfully handle per unit of time with one machine. Keep it simple, with one machine. On the, on the horizontal axis, we have the number of concurrent requests that hit a single machine, that start executing in a single machine. Now, of course, the more pressure you put on a machine, at some point you're going to see a degradation of response time. You're going to see a slowing down of the entire speed of that system because you're going to have memory issues, you're going to, you're going to compete on, on processor, you're going to kill the database behind you. Something is going to go bad if you push too much load on a single system. Now, for many years already, what we've done, we, we took that load that was too high and we enqueued some of it keeping it under, to, 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 to bring back the load in the comfort zone, to bring back the load in the sweet spot. So if your load is here, you can keep some of that, those requests in a, in a queue uh, and then have this amount of load running right now in your, in your, in your system. The requests that accumulate in the queue are going to be dissipated over several milliseconds or maybe seconds, allowing you to, to stay here, basically. Right? But then if you put this queue, if you want to t talk in spring terms, at async, for example, right? you're going to defer some of the processing, maybe for a while. Now, but if you put this queue in place, you need to be careful with how much time you allow, you allow the tasks to wait. You don't want the, the tasks to wait for seconds, many seconds in a row. And also, you don't want that queue to blow up. What if that's, that load is so high that basically out of memory is you? Right? So at some point, this queue, this, this queue that you put in your system, you need to keep track of them. And I see very few teams monitoring their queue waiting time and their queue sizes between the applications. They just call an async method and they feel smart. Where instead that queue can keep a request for 30 seconds in the queue. Is that normal? I want to see that. Right? And what's the maximum size for that queue? These questions you need to, you need to, uh, to address, you need to realize. Okay. 
Right. Now, one simpler topic, which is often neglected, unfortunately, is the fact that any data that comes into your system has to be validated before you invest any resources in it. Before you, before you spend memory, processor, network, working for that request, you want to make sure that the parameters are correct. We all validate the requests that our clients send us, but somehow we forget to validate the responses that we get from APIs that we call. We just take them for granted. And then five seconds later, we realize, oops, that field should not have been null. Uh-oh, right? So it, pay the same attention to what comes in your system from your clients and from other systems that you call. Now, don't, be, don't become control freaks with this. Don't go too far. I've seen teams that validate the responses they get from other systems versus their schema. Why? If you only use two fields in the 40 fields you got from them, why do you care if they did not put some required field in their response? Why do you care? You care about those two fields, right? So the robustness principle says that you should be conservative in what you do, in what you provide, in what you export, but be tolerant in what you accept. That's called the robustness principle or the Postel's law. Don't go too far, don't start to validate stuff that you don't really need, basically, okay? Okay, so isolation patterns we've covered by now, right? Parameter checking, bulkhead, throttling, and we heard about bounded queues. Now, latency control. When you call a system, the first thing that you should put in place is timeouts. Now, how big should the timeouts be? Right? And anytime you block, not only when you call network, perhaps you, you block to get a signal in a reactive sync or you do a future dot get or God knows what. Anytime you block, you need to have a timeout set there. If the timeout is too large, of course, my response time is going gonna, is gonna to ramp up. Now, what I found really scary is that some very popular Java frameworks have unbound default uh, timeouts. If you use web client or REST template, and if you don't configure anything, your call is blocked forever. You need to realize that. Do you want to be blocked forever? Is that normal? Right? Now, if you go too short with the timeout that you put, you could be returning false errors, of course. You could be returning an error to your client, even though the server you called is still working on your request and might eventually succeed the operation. Right? That's a false error. It's also bad. So you need to keep this timeout somewhere above what's normal for them, perhaps above the 99th percentile, or if they publish some service level agreement, above what they call maximum, right? Okay, and have that monitored. One scenario I found once is that they had some timeouts for, for another service they were calling, but then that service changed the implementation and added 50 milliseconds to their response time. Suddenly, they were timeouting every call they did on, that, on, on them. So you need to be able to detect such cases as fast as you can. You raise alarms, report metrics to see how many timeouts do I had, did I have uh, in the last, I don't know, five seconds, right? All right, so we have a call that failed or timed out. Great. Let's retry. Well, before you retry, you need to answer a couple of questions. For example, what was the reason of the failure? If it's a 400 bad request, it, it's your fault with the client fault. If it's a 500, you don't have a clue. If it's a timeout, you could, give, you could try to retry. And I, I also uh, found recently the, the following convention. If the server allowed the client to retry, it would reply in the body of the failure with a JSON saying retryable false or true. Basically, the server kept control on whether the clients are allowed to retry the same operation or not. Does it worth retrying or should I just f throw the error uh, upstream. How many, how, how many retries, how many, how many, uh, what's the back off between those retries and so on. And one of the important things that she comes to play here is idempotency. Am I allowed to retry without doing bad things? Right? So an operation is idempotent if retrying it, if repeating it does not do any harm to the state of the server. So for example, if you get the product by ID, the get should not change anything. We hope. So <laughs> ideally, this is an idempotent, uh, this is an idempotent operation. Cancelling a payment. 
should also be item potent because canceling, canceling it again shouldn't do any harm, right? Uh, it's actually a very important rule in, in, uh, when building compensation actions like this, that the compensating transaction, canceling what was previously done, is made item potent. Otherwise, recovering from error becomes a, becomes a hell. Update the product price. Set the price to another value. You could repeat the, the operation. The, the, the price will not change again if you've successfully set it the first time. But if you receive a call like place order, repeating that, retrying that operation might end up in two orders being placed. And there was a famous recent example with Food Panda in UK. A guy received five orders, I think, because he placed the order and the, the mobile app retried without the endpoint being item potent. And the guy got five orders instead of one. Right? And the bad news, he had to pay for them. So, yes. right? Now, you can do tricks. One very big e-shop I have in my country, if you try to place the same order within the within one hour, it's going to tell you, hey, you've already ordered uh, this 40 minutes ago. Is this a duplicated order? It's going to reject your, your order. There is another strategy to fix this and to make, post, to make place order item potent, which is to allow the client to give you the ID. If the client adds a unique identifier to the request and it repeats the same identifier with all the retries, you could just you will just have a a unique key violation if you try to persist the same order. Okay? So there are tricks you need to do sometimes to make your operation item potent. And only then did your can your clients retry. So good luck retrying. Okay, but what if? What if, over the last five minutes, every single request you sent to that system failed or timed out? Maybe 99.9%. .9%. Maybe, what was the light speed percentage that they, that they got with the Large, large Hadron Collider? 99.9999999991 of, of, uh, of, the, of the speed of light. What if that kind of requests fail every time? What do you do? What are the chances that a new call is going to succeed? Should you play the new request if the server keeps failing? Well, there is a principle in building resilient system, which is that if you know that you are going to fail, at least fail fast. And an application of this is the circuit breaker. Who of you has heard of circuit breakers before? Right, so I'm going to be fast because most of you did. The, the circuit breaker is just going to interrupt the flow of requests when it sees the server on the other side um, having issues to, re to reply. So the circuit breaker is going to start in the closed state, allowing all the requests to go through, counting how many are successful errors or timed out. If that number goes over a threshold, it's going to open up, rejecting immediately all the client or all, all the requests. And that also this, that, that helps the client save resources and the server recover. You don't want to keep firing on a server which is dying. After a while, it's going to half open, allowing just a few requests to go through to test whether the server is back or not. Right? So if the server says, OK, all the requests go back successful, then the circuit breaker goes in full open state. Otherwise, it goes back into the open, uh, which is pausing the requests. It's all based on the idea that if something is going bad, you don't have, want to spend more resources trying in that direction. Okay? So all these principles, throttling, fallback, timeout, all these patterns, where should we implement them? Well, I bet when you face a system which is slow or fragile, you're going to talk about these principles, about these patterns very early. You're going to consider timeout retries when you talk to fragile systems. But also when you talk, when you, when you have calls going between bulkheads that you've identified, if, you, if a call goes from one area into the other, you need to be enforce this protection in between. So most teams, they implement these patterns in the API gateway protecting the, their microservice ecosystem. What I don't like about this is that I find 30 microservices in that, behind that API gateway. Does that mean that all 30 microservices could fail as a whole? 
uh, is that okay if uh, one of the 30 blows down, everyone goes down? So maybe the, the services that an API gateway protects, maybe we should keep that number somehow low. Right? Those bulkheads should be smaller if you want to build more resilient systems. Right? So, loose coupling. Well, um, one first very important thing is not to keep state inside a service. Any state you keep in a service is going to impede consistency, availability, and scalability. But that's somehow obvious, right? Stateless services. And you move that state into the database, you save it there. You could bring that state earlier into the client or into the mobile app or in the browser if it's related to the user flow. Or you could accept some of that state coming in as request tokens. Like the user metadata could come in as a, as a JOT token. Right? So keep your services stateless so then, then you can start a bunch of them and then just distribute load to any of them. If you have four servers and one falls down, of course, the other three is gonna, they're going to take over those requests. Nice. That's somehow default for many environments in which we deploy microservices. This is somehow out of the box there already. Hey, we have that, 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 right? But what I find developers having a hard time with is the shift towards asynchronous communication. I'm talking about messages, right? Messages over synchronous protocols. So, if you send to a message infrastructure a message, that message can be guaranteed to be delivered to the other system even if that system is currently down and unavailable. When it will, be, when it will recover back up, it will get the, 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 message, the message. And this message technique can, is, is wonderful to protect against cascading failures. If the listener for the message has a problem, the error it has, it will not ripple back into the, into the sender. Or if it takes too long to process the message, you will not find out. You will not be impacted by that in the sender. That's very good to isolate bulkheads. And I know some banks that have the following rule. Every service wants to communicate with another service of in another department of the same bank. They are not allowed to use synchronous protocol. REST, RMI, GRPC, VSDL, nothing. Only messages. Because you don't want one department to be impacted negatively by the performance of another one. So they put these rules in between. Only messages in between. Now, the shift towards asynchronous messages is always hard at first. It's hard because you don't have that call stack, um, uh, that call stack mental model that you call a service and you wait for it to complete with an error or with a result. You don't do that anymore. You just send a message, fire, and let it go. And then you need somehow to, uh, you need to redesign your flow in a way that you don't uh, have to wait for the result on the other side. And that calls for a change in architecture. That, ho that calls for using all sorts of techniques, like generating IDs on your side, like doing correlation IDs, all sorts of, of kung fu that comes to play. And that tends to scare us. But keeping in mind the resilience problems with, and patterns that we've seen before relating to the synchronous communication, suddenly rest also becomes scary, isn't it? I mean, like retry, circuit breaker, uh, uh, right? Idempotency, all of these, right? Don't, let's say, let, uh, they lower the difference, the, 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 the mental effort of messages. So, that's one thing. You don't have the status, you don't have the result from the invocation if you use a messaging infrastructure. Uh, and something that really, really is hard to understand is that, the, is that when you send a message on the other side, apparently it's easy. But the fact that you don't know if your changes are applied now or 30 seconds, 5 seconds, 20 milliseconds from now, that's really hard to, 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 to tweak. It's hard for us to understand that the, the state could still be in transit in a queue. You can't just look in the database and see the data. No, the data might be just transitioning. And that's really tricky to, uh, to master. Now, the moment you accept that your changes are going to be applied on the other side, you are stepping towards eventual consistency. And you uh, probably have heard of the CAP theorem before? CAP theorem? Ah, okay. 
one third of you. So a cap theorem states that if you start deploying your system on multiple machines, you need to choose whether you want to be highly consistent and keep all the data in sync, or whether you want to sacrifice some of that consistency to get better availability. You can't have all three, basically. And since partitioning is not something you can, and since deploying on multiple systems, is, machines, is not something you can easily remove, you, that's the definition of microservices, right? We deploy on multiple, multiple physical machines. Then you need to choose between one of these two, consistency, other availability. And that scares us, because yeah, if you want to build resilient systems, remember at the beginning, we want available, high available systems. And that means we need to trade some of the consistency for, the, for it. And it, it scares us. It could scare us because we don't know how the, what the current state is right now, but it could also scare us because we have this, this dream of building the perfectly consistent system. This dream that comes from the ages of the monolith. That all the data should be kept perfectly in sync in a large Oracle ACID transactional database. So you keep the best perfect consistent data, but then they handle the item in a wrong way and they break the item in the warehouse. Right? And, but you can have the perfect stock levels saved in the database, but the real world kicks in and you just lose an item. Or perhaps you've displayed that you had one stock left, one item left in stock for this product, but by the time the user got to click Add to Cart, someone else already purchased it. Right? So you can't really get 100% consistency in the real world. So why not embrace invention consistency and start thinking in terms of what do I lose if I go eventual consistency? What do I lose in terms of money, business, uh, user retention, and so on? Not just, hey, we need to be consistent, period. No. What do we lose if we are not? So you could find places in which you could easily recover or you could find workarounds. Oh, we're out of stock. And then the phone rings. Hey, this is customer support. We are so sorry, but the, the item you wanted to, to buy was just sold. Can we ship you another one with one week of delay so that we can get it from our suppliers? Of course. Thank you. There are business cases that can be easily and, more, and cheap, cheaper to solve than implementing the best consistent projection. Okay? Now, we are, on, we are in this train of eventual consistency of messaging systems, and the bigger brother of messages is event sourcing. The idea to store the events in a, in a database and then have those as the source of truth. Now, this is wonderful for resilience because you cannot lose anything in the past. And anything that has happened is stored as an event in an event store. So you can rebuild, you can rebuild the state of at, at any point in the, in the past. You could, by replaying the event, which is amazing for resilience, you cannot lose stuff anymore. And if you want to go super scalable for the reading part, you can use CQRS and have multiple machines consuming from that single stream of events and suddenly you can have 10 machines serving the, the searches and the reads um, uh, to meet a very high scalability need. Okay? So even sourcing is even better in this, in, this, in this sense. Hey, a golden hammer. Are the messages then... Uh, if you ever hear someone doing a lot of commercial for a certain paradigm or anything in the world, Cloud provider, the next big cloud provider, go, go with us. The f you, uh, we need to develop a sense of, uh, not disgust, but um, uh, lack of confidence. What's the correct English term for this? Skepticism. I mean, like, come on, what aren't you telling me? Right? So messages are not just flower power, are not just, just we had the next big thing, let's go messages everywhere. No, they have their own problems. Just listing a few. This would deserve a full talk of its own, but list, just listing a few. A message that keeps blowing up the listener and is retried ad infinitum. Duplicated messages. Most messaging systems, if you want decent performance, are going are gonna to offer you at least once semantics. 
So then you have to make your consumers as important. Messages which are scrambled due to retries or other reasons. Messages that come out of order. How do you reconcile those? And you, need to, uh, you could aggregate them into larger events using a time-based or a stateful aggregator, all sorts of techniques in there. Privacy. One customer of mine found the personal identification information of some customers in a message, six months old message on a queue that was blocked since spring. So they said, hey, what's that? Hey, customer data. Hey, cool. How about the right to be forgotten? Customer data in transit in a queue stored in a message nine months old. Take that. Right? Or uh, the fact that they sent um, uh, messages and they broke their, their Kafka brokers, but they had no clue that the topics were getting big. Right? Lack of monitoring. Or my personal favorite, versioning of the events in an event store system. Perfect. We can spend half a day to talk about that topic. And that will open up the discussion towards backwards, forwards compatibility, whatever that is. Okay? So, latency control. We talked about bounded queues, timeouts, service level agreements, the fail fast principle, circuit breaker, retry, uh, checking stuff as soon as you see it, bulkhead, cutting boundaries around the stuff that should work alone, throttling, putting artificial restricting artificially the load or the request to have better performance or, sta or stability, uh, stateless services, location transparency, uh, load balancing, item potency, eventual consistency, messages and events. This thing we didn't mention, some, apparently in some, in some domains it's cheaper to fire multiple requests at the same time for the same goal and have the fastest response win. There are some very uh, mission critical, like uh, in which you want extremely fast responses, in which you could call three or two or three systems at the same time and do a sort of a competition. Whoever gets here first is the winner, right? You, you can imagine the waste of resources that it's, this calls for, but some, some domains are suitable for this. Now, supervision. In terms of supervision, it's super important that our services expose a health check endpoint, like the Spring Boot Actuator Health, that uh, tells the, some monitoring tools what is the reason of the failure. For example, imagine that this service interfaces your ecosystem with some payment gateway. If that payment gateway is down, your health, met, your, your health endpoint should tell that, hey, my system that I really depend on is down. And then you can immediately pinpoint to the root cause. Monitoring, escalation, we're going to see that in the next slide. But the escalation is really, really tricky. You see, we are used that every time some work blows up to return an error to the caller. That could work initially, but then maybe the caller cannot solve the problem you are reporting. Maybe you have a problem with talking to some Kafka broker or you can't reach the other service. What can this guy do? Right? It can't, they can't help you with that. They, they, they can't help you with anything. So instead of returning the error upstream, and honestly, if you used messages to communicate between these two, you can't really send an error. How would you do that? Instead of sending them the errors backwards in the flow, you could escalate them. Right? You could maybe call a supervisor to help you reconcile that. Maybe the, the supervisor could be uh, implemented automatically, or maybe that could call for some human intervention. But what I want to point out here is that the flow of the process is orthogonal to how the errors should be reported. Most errors can't be fixed by the client, unless we're talking about some payload incorrect request or something. Right? Okay. People. We've talked about a lot of stuff today. Many patterns, many ideas, but people. No matter what problem seems to be at the first, it's always a people problem. No matter how much you've, okay, we know this stuff, good, good, but, but then, but then, to really get to these highly resilient systems that we want, you need DevOps team. And DevOps team does not mean you have a development department and an operations department. I've just recently heard this two, week, two weeks ago in a training. 
DevOps means we have an ops department, right? Wrong! DevOps means you have your team responsible for the full life cycle of your product, from conception down to production, monitoring, and back. You can't, and of course, with the help of some pure blood ops, perhaps, here and there, to help you with the tricky part, with the support of a platform team, and so on. But the ownership is in the team. If you, that's the only way we can build those resilient systems. So you need to have access to metrics, to understand how to write a graph in Grafana, to know how to set an alarm, to know how to expose a metric, to know how to trace a request across your systems and then, have, and then view the aggregated log for, well, from, from, of what the request caused to happen. And also very important to see the time spans of requests like Zipkin-like, or there are many tools doing this. And I see many teams jumping on microservices building, deploying 20 microservices, and they do not have access to their production metrics. They did not set up any kind of time, stem, type, time span reporting to any, any kind of sort. And when performance issue hits them, they're dead. They can't, how can you debug? If your call goes to seven systems, you're lost, right? So prioritize this, time to wrap up. Key points, first thing, ask yourselves, what, which of these microservices should still work if others fail? The boundaries of the bullheads. Whenever you do a synchronous call or blocking threads for any reason, ask yourself, what is the time that I want to set? Should I retry? Should I throttle? Should I, imp imp should I add a circuit breaker? Or, and, what, and how can I fail over if it really, really fails permanently? If you have slow responses, they can harm your clients of clients of clients. They will ripple back into all the cold chain before. The idea that if you take less load, you can move faster. If you fail, at least fail fast. Right? So the first thing you do, do the checks, throw fast. And don't be afraid of eventual consistency. It might be better for the business. If you understand the business problem, it could be cheaper to tolerate a bit of of inconsistency for the sake of availability. And with that, I thank you, and I will invite you to join the community. If there are any questions, perhaps we have time for one. I don't know. I didn't check the time, honestly. Perhaps. <laughs> I'll, I'll stick around for 10 minutes anyway. Any, any questions here? Yes, please. What do we include in the good health check? I've seen examples of, you know, it could be latency and blindness and readiness. Mm -hmm. And in examples where people include database availability, in the liveness check, which means that the service is killed by the community. But the service can still serve a lot of other requests which don't need database. I'm going to repeat the idea because to hear it, everyone, um, uh, including in the liveness check, uh, the fact that the database is up or the message infrastructure is reachable. If database is down or your Kafka broker is down, then you are going to be killed by Kubernetes because you're dead. So is that fair? No. But it, it turns down. It turns out how critical is that resource for your service. Is it that critical that you can't, that you, are, that you declare yourself dead? Or you, can you do enough stuff without it? If 90% of your calls go to the database, but not killed, you could say, I'm not willing to take load. Maybe your health should say down. Maybe you could say, I'm not serving requests, but don't kill me. Why kill me? Let me there. Let me, perhaps the database comes back up. That's really <laughs> melodramatic. Your database is down, you need to die. Why? What did I do wrong? I can't take traffic. Don't kill me, right? Okay, tricky one. But it, it, it comes down to what, how critical is that resource for you. So if I am the payment gateway, if I am the, the payment gateway proxy in my ecosystem, and if my payment gateway underneath is down, I'm going to declare myself un, uh, dead. Okay? Don't kill me, but I can't take traffic, I'm down. Make sense? All right, other questions? I don't want to step on the next speaker's time. So with that, thank you all.